Good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Vivek Kumar Devedi. I'm a student of IIT Delhi. Uh, this is the Indian Institute of Technology De uh, Delhi. Uh, it was set up uh, as a part of the Indian Institute of Technology Act of uh, 1971. Uh, it was Nehru's dream to create an army of scientists and engineers in India to lead the progress uh, in their uh, respective fields. Uh, I am a student of the Department of uh, Biochemical Engineering and Biotechnology at IIT Delhi. Uh, this summer, I've been uh, working in Dr. Reed's lab, uh, analyzing the effect of thermodynamic constraints on the predictive capabilities of a uh, genome uh, scale model of E. coli. Uh, and the particular one that I've been working with is known as the IJR904 model. I'll be telling you about that. So, modeling in systems biology is important because it can answer a lot of uh, questions. We can look at uh, we can try to interpret observed behaviors of systems <coughs> and answer questions such as why do cells make certain byproducts? We can generate hypotheses about unexplained phenomena. Uh, how can cells utilize certain substrates? We can ask this question. Uh, we can predict cellular behaviors of a perturbed system and predict how fast mutants can grow. And uh, one of the most important uses is identifying metabolic engineering strategies, which, such as, you know, answering questions such as which genes should be deleted to improve uh, the production of a certain product such as ethanol. So modeling systems biology is basically four steps. First, we gather the in, uh, in, uh, information about the important components and the component in, uh, interactions in biological networks from literature. This is then organized and assembled. Uh, at, uh, uh, this covered information is assembled, uh, organized and assembled at the systems level uh, using either textual, graphical, or mathematical representation. And then we go on to the modeling. Uh, so we convert the reconstruction into a model by reducing variables and equations uh, based on the chemical and physical principles that uh, we came across in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the systems level. And once the model is complete, we then uh, analyze results and we then compare it with, uh, the, uh, with existing experimental data or we use that, uh, the results of the model to design experiments. And uh, once the results are validated, then the whole cycle is complete, the results again introduced. So we, how do we go about network assembly and representation? Well, so let's say you have the glycolysis pathway, and you have the react reaction six kinase, you have uh, phosphodiester, sorry, uh, glucose six phosphate isomerase, and all such reactions with the glycolysis pathway. This is arranged in the form of a matrix, and on the left you can see all the metabolites, and at the bottom are the reactions. This matrix is known as the S matrix in, in our language. And uh, you see the coefficients of the reaction. So if, say, if you have a minus one, that means one molecule of that particular metabolite is being consumed. And a, a plus one would mean uh, uh, that uh, particular, uh, a single molecule of that metabolite is being generated. Uh, on the right here, you can see the genes uh, associated with the enzymes and those associated, uh, associated with, the, uh, with the reactions that they carry out. And uh, further on the right is the glycolysis pathway in the form, uh, as it would appear in a network. So suppose we have this flux through lysaldehyde uh, 3 phosphate dehydrogenase, and we want to uh, switch that on or off, we can do that uh, by switching the gene expression on or off. So well, how do we go about analyzing these metabolic networks? We do optimization through linear programming. And in optimization, we have an objective function, a function that is maximized or minimized to identify the optimal solutions. Uh, and in our case, we would have a function, uh, we would either have to maximize the flux or a function of the flux. So, uh, uh, and we also apply constraints. And this is done to eliminate the uh, solutions which would not make sense, which are infeasible, while leaving the feasible uh, cellular behaviors. So, we would get a result like this, where the yellow space uh, represents the, uh, the feasible uh, solutions. And the red dot is the optimal solution for uh, the problem that uh, would be so what are the constraints we place on metabolic networks? Well, the first constraint, that is a steady state mass balance constraint, is, uh, is placed on uh, it's placed on all metabolic networks because uh, we uh, analyze um, these uh, networks in the steady state. Uh, and uh, suppose we have this metabolite, which is generated through fluxes B1, B2, and B3. And we also have a flux that consumes this metabolite, uh, the flux being B4 then the amount in which it is generated should be equal to the amount in which it is consumed. And that is basically our, uh, our mass balance constraint. And this is applied to all the metabolites. So that is this picture showing all the metabolites and how uh, uh, this particular 
constraint to be applied. Second type of constraint that is applied is an enzyme capacity constraint. So we limit the flux within bounds, uh, alpha and beta being the uh, lower and upper bounds in this case. And the third type of constraint that we apply is a thermodynamic constraint in uh, which we basically uh, fix the fluxes of all the irreversible reactions at greater than zero. What are we missing out on? Well, we don't consider kinetics. And except for the thermodynamic constraints, which I'll be coming to, we don't consider concentrations. So it's a steady state analysis, and we do not look at uh, these two particular um, things. Uh, so the thermodynamic constraint. Well, uh, from the second law of thermodynamics, we know that delta G is equal to delta. Uh, so from the uh, right from second law of thermodynamics, we know that the flux for a flux to be positive for a reaction, the delta G has to be negative. And we go about calculating the delta G using this formula. So we have delta G is equal to delta G naught, which is the delta G of reaction with stomach conditions. And we uh, include the, uh, the equilibrium constant term, which is, uh, say we have a reaction like this, and the equilibrium constant becomes this. And uh, substituting that in the formula, we get delta G for the reaction. So if the delta G is positive, then the flux is negative. And if the delta G is negative, then the flux has to be positive. So this is the thermodynamic constraint that we apply. So now we have two models that we use. The FPA model is the model that has been used up till now to look at, uh, sorry, to look at uh, the fluxes in, in, a, in metabolic pathways. And what I was trying to do was uh, to apply thermodynamics instead of uh, using uh, the uh, FBA model. And the, I'll list out the differences in the two models. So in case of FBA, the reversibility is decided on the basis of literature. So we go into literature and find out which uh, reactions are known to be reversible. Uh, whereas in the case of the uh, TAPA model, which is thermodynamic uh, constraint one, the reversibility is decided on the basis of the delta G. So as in the previous slide, <coughs> if delta G is positive, then the reaction has to be in the reverse direction. And if delta G is negative, it has to be in the uh, forward direction. Uh, in case of FBA, only fluxes are important. Uh, concentrations have no role. In case of the, th the thermodynamic model, concentrations come into the picture because of the equilibrium constant. So even that is considered. In case of FBA, the constraints include mass balance and reversibility because we are uh, deciding uh, prior to analyze, uh, analysis that these particular reactions are reversible. Um, in case of TFBA, mass balance is there, yes. We place bounds on the higher and lower concentrations of the metabolites and we also include the thermodynamic constraint where the, if delta G is positive, flux is negative, delta G is negative, flux is positive. So I'd like to present uh, the two models in the form of uh, a set, the uh, a superset subset uh, uh, situation. So you have the TFBA, which is which becomes a superset of the FBA because in case of BA, only certain reactions were known to be reversible, and uh, they were allowed to be reversible. Whereas in case of TFBA, theoretically all uh, all reactions are uh, reversible. Uh, it is the, the delta G which is then deciding the direction of the reaction. Uh, and apart from that, you have mass balance and thermodynamic constraint, which I mentioned. In case of FBA, only mass balance is uh, the constraint. Now, uh, one of uh, the published works that I was working that I was looking at uh, during my stay here was uh, actually focusing on this thermodynamic constraints on FBA. And their main focus was to remove cycles that might exist in this model, in the FBA model. So, but it would not uh, uh, give you an idea. It would. It would not. Uh, it would still not allow some reactions which might be thermodynamically feasible to run in the reverse uh, direction because uh, the thermodynamic constraints are only placed on the reverse uh, reversible reactions. So my work was to look at this one. So the objectives of my project, well the first one was to make the thermodynamic model more accurate uh, in the sense that it was giving a higher, it was predicting a higher growth rate than uh, is there uh, in the actual case. Uh, so I was uh, uh, so I had to place suitable constraints, which I'll be discussing, to uh, bring down uh, the predicted growth rate. Uh, the second was to compare the prediction capabilities of FBA and TFBA for gene knockout phenotypes. Right? And the third part was to identify uh, possible reversible reactions that are shown to be reversible in TFBA, but might not uh, not might, might not be known to be reversible in literature. So we can then go on and find out if these are actually reversible. So for the first part, well, I told you that for uh, such a reaction, the equilibrium constant is this, and delta uh, G is calculated using this formula. But this becomes indirect in uh, some cases where transport 
of uh, metabolites is involved across the membrane because then uh, the transport term also has to be included. And this transport term it has uh, two components. One is due to the electrochemical gradient, and the second due to the P, uh, uh, the pH gradient. And uh, so these, which are calculated using these number formulas. So now, when we do uh, the when, when we apply some dynamic constraints, we get much better results. So coming to the comparison part, uh, the red bars are for FBA and the blue bars are for TFBA. And we see a, a very similar results for the two, which means that uh, we uh, know most of the reactions which are reversible to be so. Uh, there might be very few um, which, which might not be, be so, which we have identified, which I'll be discussing in the next part. So this was growth and glucose, and we see that, uh, so G corresponds to growth and G corresponds to no growth and we're comparing model with the experiment. So uh, TFP and FBA show very similar results. And the same is the case when we uh, do uh, the run on the plot. So both the models are pretty similar. So these are the cases in which TFBA uh, predicted much better. When we knocked out these genes, uh, we saw that TFBA uh, gives a uh, growth growth uh, phenotype, whereas uh, your uh, FBA model would show no growth. Uh, when there's actually growth taking place in the experiment. So let's analyze one case where uh, this uh, V09 to V gene was knocked out. And this is gene corresponding to uh, aspartate transaminase. So the top reaction, this corresponds to your aspartate transaminase. And when this uh, particular uh, gene is knocked out, then in FP there is no way for aspartate to be formed. Aspartate can uh, degrade into fumarate and ammonium by the aspartase reaction. But since this reaction is not reversible in FBA, there is no way to form aspartate and hence biomass bio production cannot proceed. And that's what, uh, what is shown. So, but in case of TFBA, the same reaction is reversible. And we see that it runs in the reverse direction to form aspartate and hence biomass production can take place. So uh, there are about uh, five or six more reactions like this which we have identified uh, through this analysis which we will be performing double gene knockouts to see if these are the, the reactions which are rescuing, uh, I mean, which are, yeah, which are rescuing the uh, <coughs> cell from uh, cell death. So in summary, we have, uh, I, so the thermodynamic model was uh, constrained with uh, suitable constraints for it to give uh, a, better, uh, a better protection of growth rate. The two models, the comparison gave uh, very similar results. But there were some uh, cases of differences where we found the TFBA is breaking much better. And uh, in those cases, we were able to identify the uh, reactions that are actually running in the reverse direction, and we, which we can proceed with in experiment to find out if they do actually run in the reverse direction. So my acknowledgement, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Jennifer Reed for uh, hosting me here. My mentor, Joshua Hamilton, he's helped me throughout my stay here. And the institutions and agencies involved, Program, University of Wisconsin Madison, Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, IUSSTF, 